Welcome to Around BCC. I'm Keith Thibault. We're in the month of February. That means we're full bore with our spring 2010 academic semester at all of Bristol Community College's campuses. Last month we began our show about, uh, by talking about some changes in the academic schedule for students. Well, there are more changes that students are facing beginning spring of 2010. And these changes have to do with online learning or distance learning or like the college uh, likes to call it, e-learning. Joining me to talk about some of these e-learning changes is the Dean of e-learning here at Bristol Community College, April Bellafiore. April, thank you for joining sure, us thank today. Thank you. Let's first get into uh, why were some of the changes made uh, in the e-learning system here at BCC? Sure. Last year, the college embarked on an e-learning change process. And what we wanted to do was to determine whether or not we should renew with our existing system, which we had been using since 1999, or if we wanted to go to a new system. And what we did is we pulled together a group of, um, of faculty and uh, staff on campus to really take a look at what the options were. We also sent out surveys to students and to all faculty, and we took a look at our technical requirements. So we wanted to make sure that we were getting the system that would best suit our needs. So after looking at what the options were and considering staying with the old system, we determined that a new e-learning system was actually in the best interest of the institution and really would enable us to serve our students much better and provide more opportunities for engagement and interaction online. So as you said, this was uh, basically a, a year-long process. So it gave your department and everyone on campus the opportunity to let them know changes are coming. What steps were taken to, to, to you know, alert faculty, students that changes were coming? Mm -hmm. And I guess now that we're in the semester, how has that transition worked and, and has everyone adapted to the new system? Sure. Well, it's, what we did is during the f summer semester, we actually worked with 35, sorry, 20 faculty members to develop 35 classes to run as a pilot in the fall semester. So we wanted to get a sense of any challenges that we might have uh, and working with a smaller group of faculty and students enabled us to work much more directly with them. Mm -hmm. And it was a success. Uh, we had, uh, like any tech, new technology, certainly some challenges, uh, but it was very successful and we rolled it out obviously to the entire campus for this semester. In how we let faculty know, we had a variety of different communication strategies that we employed starting last spring mm -hmm. when we made the decision to move all throughout the summer and into the fall. We physically sent out flyers. We actually sent out an, a mail uh, to every faculty member who was teaching since spring 2009. We sent out emails. We had uh, used the buzz and obviously now with around BCC. So a variety of different communication mechanisms to faculty and to students. We let them know that things were changing, that they were part of the pilot. And our real big push is during the, the first few weeks of this semester where we have our e-learning orientation sessions right. and we're encouraging students to come physically to campus or they can actually attend virtual orientations at night and on Saturdays to get accustomed to the new system. Now, are there major changes specifically for students or if students who were in e-learning courses in the past can, can pick up some of the same you know, techniques in terms of using the new system? It's similar in terms of the techniques that students would, would use, but it does look and act very different. Uh, so if they have any questions, they can certainly contact us in the site lab uh, at extension 2081, and we can certainly help them go through that process. But we've tried to work very hard with all the faculty on campus to make it as simple as possible and to make it um, structured in a way that makes it easy for students where when they get into the new system, we're actually giving them instructions and directions on where to go and, and how to find things. Mm -hmm. So, so far, so good. President Spraga says quite often in some of our professional meetings that we both attend that, you know, more and more students are, are uh, taking classes with their mice, which mm -hmm. means the e-learning program here at BCC is, is growing. Um, how has it grown? I know, you know, we see the numbers internally and, and how exponentially it has grown. How has it grown and how has it impacted, you know, the role of your staff? Mm -hmm. Well, we've actually hit two major milestones, actually three major milestones this semester. We have um, 
over 2,100 students enrolled in distance learning courses, individual students. We have over 3,000 students total that would be dual enrollment. Mm -hmm. So many students are taking more than one distance learning class. Right. And we're actually uh, offering, we offered 170 sections. We're running about 158 sections of online courses. So we're at, uh, at the highest we've ever been in all three areas. And it's important to note though that when we talk about e-learning, we often only focus on the online classes. But students all over campus use the system in a supplemental capacity. We have many faculty members that use it to supplement the face-to-face -face environment. So right. they upload PowerPoints, they upload files, they give copies of their syllabi. So it's used much more pervasively around the campus than just in distance learning. Now, uh, I guess even though we just started the new semester of spring 2010, uh, I would I would probably make the assumption that there'll be some more growth heading into the summer and, and the fall of, of 2010? I think there will be and probably some of the largest areas of growth will be in new programs. There are a number of programs that have expressed interest in moving into a hybrid format rather than a fully online format and the hybrid format allows students that face-to-face -face time mm. particularly in a lab environment or hands-on environment and also provides them an opportunity to do some of their coursework online and that is a model that works really well for students and actually is a model that that as even though I'm Dean of eLearning uh, I prefer the hybrid model myself for learning so mm -hmm. we try to offer the different options on campus so some students would prefer the fully online some enjoy the hybrid and some enjoy the face-to-face -face. so it really is a matter for students to figure out what works best for them people have any questions about the e-learning program here at BCC how can they Get in touch with you. Uh, they can actually contact me at my extension. I'm at extension 2387. The, uh, they can also contact us by going to the college's website right. and then clicking on academics and then e-learning. We have a variety of links to our online help wiki. We have links to our contact information. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions that students or faculty or any community members might have about e-learning at BCC. April, thank you for joining us and, and great advice and hopefully people will get some help. Great, thank you. We'll take a break and have more of Around BCC right after this. Hello, my name is Wayne Wood, Director of Public Safety here at Bristol Community College. Bristol Community College, Fall Rivers Campus, shares Ellsbury Street with two area high schools, Bishop Conley High School and BMC Durfee High School. If the college is closed due to weather or for some other reason, it is likely both high schools are going to close at the same time. With approximately 300 students leaving Bishop Conley and over 2,000 students leaving Durfee, our students and staff often find it very difficult to get off campus. We put together this video to give you alternative ways to leave campus without getting caught in traffic jams, especially at the intersection of President Avenue and Ellsbury Street. We want you to arrive at your destination with minimum delays, but most of all, to arrive safely. The majority of our students and staff only know one way to get home from here, and that is to take a left out of the campus onto Ellsbury Street. As an alternative, take a right onto Ellsbury Street. At the end of Ellsbury, you'll bear left, which will put you on Valentine Street. At the third stop sign, you will intersect with Robeson Street, Anyone living in Fall River can take any direction from Robinson Street to reach their primary destination. If New Bedford, Providence, Taunton, or Newport is your desired destination, then take a right onto Robinson Street and head north. Robinson Street will turn into Highland Avenue. At the end of Highland Avenue is a set of lights. This is the intersection of Highland Avenue and Wilson Road. Continue straight through this intersection and the road merges onto Route 24 North. If Taunton or Points North is your destination, just continue north on Route 24. For those of you heading to Providence or New Bedford area, you will want to head south on Route 24. To do this, take your first exit off Route 24 North, which is Exit 8 Airport Road. Take a left at the lights and follow the road to the rotary. Take your first right off the rotary which puts you onto 24 South. Route 24 South will bring you to Interstate 195 East or West. East will take you to the New Bedford area and West will take you to the Providence area. Will you please do me a favor? Someday on a good day or when you have time, try taking this alternate route. 
and see for yourself that you do have options when you leave our campus. Thank you very much, and remember, your goal is to arrive home safely. Welcome back. February is the month for love as we celebrate Valentine's Day. What better way to do this than through our love for sweets? Chef Gloria Cabral of the BCC Culinary Arts Department joins us again to show us an easy-to-make dessert to share with all our loved ones. Good morning. I'm Chef Gloria Cabral here at Bristol Community College, uh, chef instructor at the Baking and Pastry Program here. Here's my student, Courtney Silver, who is also a Skills USA contestant and competitor, and she will be graduating this year. We'll be making today a wonderful dessert, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is a time of love, and it's not just the love of a spouse, husband, companion, it's also children. Uh, so we're thinking of all these wonderful flavors for it. Also, chocolate is one part of Valentine's Day. So our dessert today is going to be a peanut butter chocolate tart. In our original recipe, you can put this in a nine inch uh, pie pan, but we're going to make small individual desserts because nowadays everybody's watching what they eat. So we're going to need a smaller piece of dessert, which is very rich, full of flavor and no calories. We take out all the calories and fill it with love. Okay, our crust will be a half a cup of crushed peanuts mixed in with about one package of graham cracker crumbs. I use cinnamon uh, leftover gingerbread cookies from Christmas because there was an abundance of it and it had another little flavor to it. We had a little bit of melted butter, just one stick in there and we will mix it to a nice crumbly stage. Easy to, you, you can use a spatula or use your hands or anything else. And Courtney makes it so it's just hold together. If you find it's dry, you can add a little bit more butter. If you're worried about calories, you can use margarine, but I prefer it's always better with butter because it's a natural thing. Your body loves butter. Uh, it, it absorbs it. It breaks down much better than using other products. She'll put about a scoop. We, use, we always use levels in here, scoops, because it makes it more uniform. And she'll scoop it in. You can make it a little rounded and put one in and press it in the sides. You can use mini cupcake pans. If you're having family over, you want little bite-sized things, or if you want to do one big pie, that's all up to you. You press it in nice and neat. And what I do is I chill it or I freeze it because then I can just pop it out to work with it after that. See, nice and easy, and if you want, you just make it nice and smooth. The next part is the filling, the mousse. You have to remember, who's coming to dinner are they allergic to peanuts if they're allergic to peanuts you need to change this this can become a chocolate mousse with a graham cracker crust so you can still play around but just change certain parts of the recipe here we have peanut butter we have uh, let's see what do I put in there just about a cup of peanut butter and one package which is nice you don't have to measure it out a package of cream cheese we'll mix that in with three quarters of a cup of confectionery sugar A lot of times we'll sift the confectionery sugar because it gets lumps in it, especially in the summertime. We'll leave that like that. In the winter, it's drier, so it, it keeps it a little bit more um, falling apart, brittle. When you cream, you want to mix all your ingredients together. Start slow, and we'll work our way a little faster. Creaming method is used for baking cookies, a very basic um, method because you want to incorporate air into your batter. And you keep creaming this until it's nice and smooth, uniform, light. If I was creaming a butter, the same thing. It would be lighter than the color I started with. And we'll add a little bit more. There we go. And I scrape off all the sides here. See how nice and light everything's one color. If it has a little bit of peanut butter from my spatula, I can just mix that in. And I will take this off because that's one part of your mousse. See, nice and smooth, nice and light. The next part is the whipped cream. And when you make a mousse, you, it's always considered with some type of base and a whipped cream. I'm going to add a little sugar in my bowl and the whipping attachment. 
We used half a cup of, I mean a quarter cup of sugar, regular granulated sugar, and two cups of heavy cream. First I start slowly incorporating it, it helps the sugar dissolve. And we'll bring it up a little bit. You don't want it to go too slow at the beginning because then you'll end up with butter. And once it starts foaming, it'll come up a little bit, I'll end up putting it on high till a soft, floppy peak, and I'll show you. See it's slowly coming together? I have to watch it very carefully at this stage because if I don't, it'll separate. Now it's becoming nice and soft. And I'm looking for it. A lot of baking is watching. I have very soft peaks here. It's not too mixed. So now I'll carefully fold in a little bit first because if I fold it all in, it will all separate. It's much better incorporating a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time because sugar will attach to sugar and your rest of ingredients will come together. If you add all at the same time, you'll have lumpy products. See, I just keep folding, scraping, coming to the middle, scraping out the edge. I don't want to beat it too much, and that's what I'm saying. If you keep your whipped cream nice and soft, it will come together, and it won't break apart. And I can keep mixing it and mixing it, and it's not going to fall apart on me because I kept my whipped cream at a very soft stage. Here we have our shells. Now I'll, I'll use this. Always add a little bit more hidden love. I'll add a little bit of the ganache I made in each shell. See, just think of that as a secret surprise bite. Nobody will know. I always keep pastry bags even at home. It's a good thing to have. It's, they're local to every uh, craft store. You can buy them. A couple of tips. You don't need a whole assortment. Just basic tips. I use the same tip for mashed potatoes as I will for a mousse. And I'll fill this up because it's easy. It's convenient. I don't have to worry about washing it. I just throw it away. But I have to... There we go. Squeeze a little bit out. And I'm going to carefully fill each of the shells. See, nice. Doesn't that look good already? Nice and easy. Now you always have to garnish it. People know we have, we, they don't know there's chocolate in here, so I'll take a little bit of chocolate. Easy way, take some more of my leftover ganache that I have, and I'd fill it. You can put it in a Ziploc bag, a little poke hole in it. I just use a paper pa bag, and we carefully just drizzle some nice chocolate on top. Mmm. Okay, just think, no calories, lots of love. Make this for everybody in the family. Valentine's Day is meant as a day for love. But the original part was a love for, I think it was a father and a daughter, and he was in jail, St. Valentine. It's a great, wonderful story. If you have time, read it, look about it, and then see how it's become more commercialized to a wonderful day of love. The next we will do is take a little bit of our, can I have a towel, please, for my hands? Peanuts. I mean, it says now we know we, this has peanuts and peanut butter and chocolate in it. So it's a wonderful treat. I would let this sit for a little while in the refrigerator and then we come up with some different plating ideas. Can I have a plain plate, please? And then you can bring out the other plates that are in already done. Yeah, I can bring them all out. I'll take the same bag, and I'm just going to make little hearts. It's that little special touch. You know, your, your ganache will melt, come together a little bit, so you can emphasize the 
bigger parts. And as it comes together, and you can write love. Leave big spaces because it will close up a little bit. What I always try to do is put a little spot in the center because as I'm walking my dessert to the table, or if I'm doing this in a restaurant or a sitting, I don't want it to slide across all the hard work I've done. Carefully. Okay. Nice. Your dessert should always look all the way around the same way, so if I ever, whichever way we put this, it'll be really nice. And this is our peanut butter chocolate tart. On this month's edition of Alumni in Your Community, we stay inside our BCC family and talk with a woman who's used her position here at BCC to help students both inside and outside the classroom. Hello, I'm Joanne Carroll Connor and I am BCC class of 1976. I'm a Fall River native and uh, my interest has always been in education. Even when I was very young, my, one of my dreams was to become really an English teacher initially, and that's uh, my undergraduate degree is in English. Um, but I ventured into the business area, a Durfee grad, um, and spent a semester up at Bridgewater, and then transferred back here to Bristol Community College. I was very typical of our students uh, trying to work a 32 hour week as well as go to school full time and of course that's a deadly mix, it's still a deadly mix and many times the immediate uh, dollar wins out over the longer, you know, the long range plans of getting a degree. It's a characteristic that it even, I find even today, it, which is that you can come in and talk to an administrator. You can come in and talk to somebody who is immediately going to help you with, uh, with what you need to do. It, they're not going to say, well, you need to go over there or you need to call. It, and that administrator for me was a lady named Patricia Scott, who I walked in maybe two weeks before school started and said, I'd like to come back to school. And she said, okay, here's what you need to do. And that woman just paved that way. And, I, and I, remarkably, we still hold that philosophy. I finished up in two years and then transferred up to UMD. Once I completed my bachelor's degree at, um, at uh, UMD, I came here in the, early, um, in the early 80s and started working under a grant program down on Durfee Street. So I'm, the, I'm not only an alum of the college, I like to consider myself an alum uh, at least professionally, of the old Durfee Street campus. And there's, there's quite a few of us still around. Uh, after that, while I was working here, I, um, I got my, back, my master's degree in business administration uh, from UMD, and then went away to work full-time for the sheriff's office in uh, New Bedford. Currently, I'm the associate registrar, and I'm very fortunate in that the registrar's office is one of those hubs in the college that get to deal with people everywhere. I, so I get to deal with faculty and students and administrators and support staff, not only here at, at in the Fall River campus, but also at the other campuses, as well as the satellites. In addition to my job here, my day job, I'm also an adjunct faculty member. I've been teaching here at the college since the early 80s um, for both credit and non-credit. Uh, currently, I teach Accounting 11 and Accounting 12, 51, 52, and 53. So it's, uh, I've also done some business courses. So again, the lines blur a little bit with, uh, with the two jobs because I'm always keeping the instructor hat on as well as the associate registrar's hat. Especially uh, satisfying for me is when you have a student, particularly for someone who hasn't been in school for a while, who comes in and they're very, you know, they're not sure they can do this and, you know, they're not sure that they can handle school. There's an all, a lot of other responsibilities. And to sit down with that person and say, you can do this, it's very, very re rewarding. While I'm teaching, I'm uh, helping students select classes. 
And while I'm helping students select classes, I'm also discussing, you know, what are your study skills like? And are you setting enough time aside for that part of your life? So the roles kind of blur a little bit when we talk to students. But, and also too, if they need, of course, with being part of the enrollment center, if they need help with their financial aid, or if they have questions about their program, or if they need help with or another uh, part of the college, we just get on the phone and just we just do that there. So it really is one stop in the sense that you don't have to say, okay, I'm going to help you with this little piece, but then you have to leave and get some assistance someplace else. And that's one thing, going back to that same philosophy that I saw with Patricia Scott, if you can handle it while a student's there and help them so that when they walk out, they've got the complete package. That's very, that's, that's very rewarding. It really is. There's not too many times or many places that you have that kind of reaction to where you work. Um, some folk, and it's, uh, inevitably it's a positive one. So it's a, ma it's a source of pride. And even my, I have a very large family, and they'll say, well, and, and if, whether they're in healthcare or they're in education or they're in business, and they'll say, oh, where do you go? And they'll say, oh, I go to BCC. And they'll say, oh, um, my sister Joanne works there, or my, you know, my friend Joanne works. There's an immediate connection there, and they'll always refer back, whether it's uh, a family member at Charlton Memorial Hospital or somebody else who's working in, in insurance, wherever they go, there's that positive connection uh, with the college, and it really is a great source of pride. Here are some other news and notes from around BCC. Bristol Community College has been recognized by the trade publication Community College Week as being the fastest growing community college in Massachusetts. The bi-weekly magazine notes that BCC's student population has increased 9.6% based on the fall 2007 and fall 2008 enrollment figures. That increase also ranks BCC 37th in the top 50 community colleges nationwide, with an enrollment of between 5,000 and 10,000 students. The unofficial kickoff to the college's African American History Month festivities took place at the 10th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast held during the celebration of Dr. King's birth. The breakfast again featured winners of the student essay and art contest, as well as a number of musical selections. The keynote address was presented by Janet Johnson Bryant, an activist and journalist from Liberia who helped organize a female movement against the oppressive government that existed over that country's 40-year civil war. Liberian women got tired of the violence. And in 2002, we formed an unprecedented force, Christian and Muslims alike, named Women in Peace Building Network, WIPNET for short. Christian and Muslim women had never shared anything in common prior to the war in Liberia. WIPNET became a pressure group and an uninvited negotiator at the final peace talks held in Ghana in 2003. WebNet used the airwaves to appeal to parents, children, warlords, the entire Liberian society to end the war. WebNet went into the community advocating for peace. We dressed in white t-shirts and carried placards with messages of peace. The women did not stop there. In order to ensure a restructured society and regain international confidence, we believed that a female should be elected as president of Liberia. Women were then encouraged to become registered members of political parties and active in the electoral process. This would then allow them to vote and be voted for. Liberian women came out in their thousands, elected the first female president in Liberia and on the continent of Africa. More women were also elected to serve in Congress in Liberia. Events celebrating African American History Month at BCC will take place throughout the entire month of February. For more information, log on to the BCC website. That's all for Around BCC this month. I'm Keith Tebow. Thanks for watching. <music>